All right, so it looks like we are broadcasting. <laughs> so we'll just give our viewers a few moments here just to see the notification and to join us here for the live stream. Uh, today's live stream is with uh, Fotis Flit Flevotomos, who is our current artist in residence here at the Siena Art Institute. So uh, it's great to have you here both for our broadcast today, but also to have you here uh, for this whole residency this month. <laughs> so, um, as we're waiting to um, have our viewers uh, come join us here, let me just um, briefly um, introduce today's talk and today's speaker. Um, again, we're both here at the Siena Art Institute, but we've set ourselves up in separate rooms um, for the broadcast, uh, just so we can more uh, easily speak to our viewers without our masks on. <laughs> so we're sort of partially in person, partially virtual. <laughs> So, but for um, today's live stream, this is part of our series for the month of March with um, our starters live online talks. And this month we're talking about the themes of accessibility and inclusion in art and design. And today's speaker um, is a visual artist who has parallel interests in access and multi-sensory practices in museums. His uh, current residency here at the Siena Art Institute has received support from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. And since 2012, Fotis's artistic explorations have involved experimentation with his iPad. An aspect of his research focuses on digital color and the effects of backlit screens on his art making process. His museum work combines elements of verbal description, participatory discussions, performance pieces, audiobooks, touch tours, and storytelling. He has um, created programs of seeing with the senses at the Banaki Museum. Uh, these are programs for visitors who are blind or partially sighted. He has also designed such programs for the Celis Manor Center in New York, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center, and the Museum of Cycladic Art in Athens. Fotis studied painting at the Athens, Athens School of Fine Arts in Greece and earned his master's in philosophy in art and music theory at the University of Essex in the UK. In 2012, he received a Fulbright grant and was hosted by the New York Public Library to explore the connections between art and low vision and contribute to their initiatives and services for patrons who are blind or have low vision. His drawings have been published in, in the journal Leonardo from MIT Press, the New York Public Library blogs, and other popular news and culture websites. Uh, Fotis is currently working with curator Lydia Matthews on the design and development of a walk shop, an open house event that was inspired by the lives of Patrick and Joan Lee Ferner in Greece. So as more viewers are now joining in on the broadcast, first let me welcome you all for joining us today. Um, during this live stream, we welcome you to leave comments uh, or questions, which we'll be able to see and respond to during this live broadcast. So it's wonderful to have the chance to speak with you today, Fotis. Thank you, Lisa, for this very warm welcome and a big thank you to all the CN Art Institute staff for uh, hosting me and for welcoming me here both online and as you say, at, at physically at the Institute. Um, so I would like to start my presentation with my slides. Let me make sure that they select the, the full screen mode. Sure. Here. Okay. And uh, as you said, uh, I'm a visual artist. I have been experimenting a lot with the iPad, which I, I bought my first iPad about 10 years ago, and I started um, studying the color relations of um, um, digital color and the way they appear on the backlit screens, as you said. Here is a poster of the National Garden in Athens that I made recently. And uh, I tried in this picture to um, combine as many greens as possible. I mean, the greens that the iPad can produce. But apart from the color relationships, I'm also interested when I paint in spaces that combine multiple perspective designs. This these two pictures here are, are 
essentially the same subject. The one on the left was made on the iPad. It's the interior of a restaurant in Brussels. But the picture on the right is a, a variation of this um, uh, interior, but I have used here a lot more um, 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 viewpoints. Uh, I have seen my subject from many different angles, so I would say that this is a lot more uh, distorted painting. Uh, but apart from my uh, uh, pictorial uh, activities, I am also interested in making access programs for people who are blind or have low vision. Uh, I got a Fulbright grant again about 10 years ago and went to New York City and had an excellent opportunity to meet people from the Metropolitan Museum, the Guggenheim, and the New York Public Library and see how they welcome visitors who are blind or partially sighted. So since then I have worked uh, with many institutions in Athens. The most important of these um, relationships and collaborations, I would say, is um, the Benaki Museum, uh, where I design uh, and lead a monthly program for people who have low vision or are blind. These two pictures are from uh, this program. I'm going to come back to all these and describe them in detail. But I would um, I would like to answer two questions basically that have to do with the subject of this presentation. The first is why I'm attracted to digital color and why I have an interest in museum access. And the answer basically has to do with, um, as I said, the subject of this presentation and the title of this presentation, uh, which is the truth and resourceful, resourcefulness of a limitation. And by limitation, I mean a genetic disorder that has to do with the lack of, of a certain enzyme and this enzyme is responsible for producing a melanin. I'm now showing six photo portraits of people with albinism. The, the kid on the right with the black sweater and the black glasses is me. So when you have albinism, you uh, have usually white skin and white hair, and you, you have a number of eye-related disorders. Uh, in my case, uh, I have been mostly affected um, um, in relation to what I see rather than, I mean, the color of my skin is pretty white for the Greek standards, but I have ocular albinism, which means that I have low visual acuity. I have poor stereo vision. I don't have a good sense of depth sometimes. I, I'm sensitive to bright light and I have uh, difficulties in perceiving movement. Uh, but these limitations have made me feel more confident when I explore uh, in my painting things like color versus line drawing or when I work with digital color versus physical pigments or when I use color of equal luminance versus color, colors of tone contrast. And of course, as I said before, I like to uh, compose pictorial spaces of multiple perspectives. So this is one picture, another poster uh, of Athens, uh, where you can see, I guess, all these things. I use colors of equal luminance. And if I zoom in here, you might see that the streets and the blocks um, with the buildings um, correspond to different perspective designs. Uh, my next slide is a more recent one, which is again the same kind of thing, multiple spaces and colors that lack tone contrast. This is a drawing I made many years um, ago in Finland. It's a watercolor color and ink drawing. Again, you can see these multiple perspectives that I'm referring to. And this is another interior in Greece where I tried to um, to to uh, 
experiment with uh, the limits of digital color, see how bright they can be and how intense the relationships between them. So this is a very briefly my interest in painting. I'm, I'm gonna go now to my museum work, um, which includes basically two different, uh, three different categories. The one has to do with uh, uh, the creation of tactile experiences and play-based resources. And when I say tactile experiences, I mean that we often use original um, um, pieces from the collection. Uh, we always uh, ask for uh, the help of the conservation department so that we make sure that our participants can touch and explore the original pieces. But um, I would say that this is a very important part of what we do because we are very enthusiastic and feel very privileged uh, that we can, um, you know, have this unique access um, to historical, let's say, works of art. Uh, so this is a dress uh, made for a theater production that was made in the early 20th century. Uh, these are works by the Greek sculptor Yanis Papas, again, original works that we used during a drawing workshop for, uh, for the blind. Uh, apart from the original works, we also um, design and create other three-dimensional objects. Here you can see a ceramic puzzle, which was inspired by these geometrical patterns of the floor uh, from Cairo. The, the original floor is depicted on, it is, it, you can see it on uh, the picture, in the picture on the left, and the tactile puzzle uh, can be seen in the picture on the right. This was for us very important because it was a good way to speak about the repetition of the, the idea of repetition of motifs in Islamic art and how this can uh, constitute or compose um, a, a surface that that can can be repeated either on the walls or on the floor uh, of a building. So this is another board game that we made for kids in order to help them understand the use of perspective in the works of the Greek of, of Greek painter Opi Zuni. Uh, the kids had an opportunity to experiment with the black and white cubes and create different different kind of floors, uh, of floor patterns. I mean some of them would um, make very clear uh, the vanishing points and the idea of perspective. Um, if, he, if they made different patterns uh, of, uh, of the floor, then perspective was not as apparent. So it's again a good um, um, way for them to perceive what the painter is interested in. We have also worked with uh, tactile maps the one on the left was used for a, a walk in the National Garden of, of Athens. And the one on the right is an embroidered map of the cyclades that we used for a kit, for a kit, yeah, that we made uh, with Haramara Didu and Fotis Sagonas for the Museum of Cycladic Art. Uh, this is another board came for the life of El Greco in Italy with light. So apart from the tactile objects, we also work with sound. One of our, our most successful project was the recording of the sounds of the jewelry collection that one can see um, in the Benaki Museum. The Benaki has a great variety of different uh, jewelry pieces that produced sounds. So we decided to uh, make a panorama of the soundscape that these pieces can produce from the ancient times. The, the, the golden piece that you see in the picture on the right is more than 3,000 years old and it produced a very, uh, very soft sound 
The one on the left is much um, um, younger, and it, the sound was more uh, bold and uh, loud. And this is a picture from the process of recording, always with the support of the conservation depart department and the people who work there. Otherwise, these things can be very, uh, how can I say, very, very fragile. Very fragile, and it, is, it it might be a big risk for us to you know to uh, work uh, if we don't know all the details, the scientific details of how we could you know uh, touch these objects and what to expect from them. So this is another. Um, uh, method that we have used in the past for our workshops. Um, it's a music poster with conductive ink. You might also um, see this ink as electric paint, which is the black ink in uh, the picture on the right. So if you touch this black ink, uh, this is connected to an Arduino device and it activates sound files. So we worked with kids from the music school uh, in Athens, and they wanted to make a visual depiction of a uh, fugue by Johann Sebastian Bach. So they created visual motif, visual um, shapes and forms that were corresponding to certain musical motives. They recorded the motives with their own instruments themselves, and the blind people later could explore um, the, um, uh, the poster because it, it, it was tactile itself as well. And here the uh, corresponding uh, music recording. This was again made with a collaborator that I had at the time for the Saronas. And uh, another thing we like to do is uh, invite artists and curators uh, to work with us. Um, in this picture, you can see an artist who has also low vision and uh, uses um, found objects to compose his own sculptural works. And he, we, commi we commissioned to him a series of works that would be in dialogue with certain pieces from the Benaki collection, but our participants would be able then to explore and, and learn a few things about how contemporary artists work and why he made these specific choices and how he responded to the pieces from the collection. So it's not just the historical information about what we have in the collection it's also how they can work they can work these pieces as a starting point for contemporary artists to um, let their imagination produce new art and this is a picture from a sound choreography that uh, Vasily Kispa who made for the Benaki again um, we selected a certain story from the Greek mythology that can be supported uh, by pieces from the collection. And Vasiliki created a, a soundscape, a choreography that was uh, based on sounds that she and the other dancer produced through their mouths or with their bodies. And they could move around in the gallery and the kids, the blind kids could experience this a choreography around them. It was um, for them also um, a 3D sound choreography. And again, this is a photo from a walk in the National Garden in Athens. We started this walk with a body warm up that helped the participants um, experience the garden better and more relaxed afterwards. Uh, we also ask um, writers to write short stories that are inspired by um, works from the Benaki collection. Uh, the only thing we ask for is that the stories they write, because 
they, it, it, they are fictional texts. Uh, the stories that they write have a, a valid historical uh, background that whatever happens in the story could have happened in reality. Uh, so this is, has been also uh, pretty successful. And then we um, invite actors like Oye Isaiah, uh, whom you can see on the left, or musicians like Lena Marcelo uh, to interpret the stories. And of course, I should say the name of, of the gentleman in the middle, which is Elias, who is Elias Polatos, and he has worked with us and has done wonderful work. And uh, okay, and this I think is. Let me check the time. Yeah, that's my last. Uh, slide, which is about our upcoming project in Mani, in the South Peloponnese. Uh, this is again a workshop, uh, a two-hour walk in and around the house of Patrick Lee Fermore. And um, we have again invited musicians and um, choreographers to produce their own interventions uh, that we hope will suggest new ways of um, sensory and social observation. So uh, this is going to happen this coming April and May, and there will be a film and we will broadcast everything um, on a certain date so people from all over the world can join us and see how we have worked with the focus group in situ. So I think that's more or less what I wanted to um, show to you tonight. Uh, you can see now my website. And uh, I, I think I will stop here in case there are any questions or comments or observations that you would like to discuss with me. Great. So thank you so much. It was really fascinating to have this glimpse into some of your very varied activities, both with your personal work of the iPad drawings and um, physical drawings, as well as this um, wonderful range of activities that you're doing within museums and other cultural institutions. And we've gotten a lot of wonderful comments and also some questions that have come in from our viewers. Um, more of a statement, but would be interesting to hear your response response um, from uh, Jeff Shapiro, who writes, I'm struck by the idea of using a so-called limitation as the impetus for art. You've inspired me to consider the, possibil the possibility that maybe every artist works this way, using the idiosyncrasies of subjective personal perception as a starting point. Yeah, well, the thing is that, and this is something that they discovered later, uh, and when I tried to be more conscious about what happens in my own art making practice. The thing is that you have a starting point. In my case, the starting point, as I said, was this uh, visual disorder. But then whatever, I mean, the journey, the path that you follow in your uh, art practice is uh, determined by your own aesthetic choices and interests. So um, it's a mix of things. Uh, I, 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 in, in my case, I don't see what I have as a limitation. It, it's, it's another starting point. It could be a different start, starting point. And again, in order to develop it, I would have to see um, you know, what are the things I'm interested in and what kind of choices I can make. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, there, there was a kind of a more technical question that came in from Jacqueline Toon. She's saying, I'm really interested to know more about how you exhibit your iPad drawings and what you feel about how works translate from one screen to another, online viewing, et cetera. Um, when you show this work, um, do you show them as um, digital prints or do you show them on um, flat screens, for example, in an exhibition? Well, to organize a proper exhibition with many flat screens would be very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Again, I'm not sure if the result on a flat screen would be the same as, um, you know, the, the color tones and hues that they get on my iPad screen when I work. So you can have equally good results every, uh, either if you decide to print them out with a good professional, um, you know, um, that um, knows how to do that, or if you decide to exhibit them in a museum gallery with a variety of uh, iPad screens or other screens, it can work both ways. I, I, I'm very personally, I'm very happy when I see them printed uh, in good quality paper and ink. And of course, with um, the chance to also see your work on your websites or on your Instagram accounts, obviously people are seeing your work just on their own personal devices, which may be a smartphone, maybe a tablet or a computer screen. So it's interesting to see um, yeah, how that changes how people interact with your work as well. It's true. And Instagram works as a kind of personal online gallery. Yeah, so um, there was a question that came in about um, the types of programs that you do um, in different locations. This is um, from the research to prevent blindness saying, how can these wonderful programs be replicated at locations around the world? I'm wondering if you find when you work with different communities in different countries um, that you find different types of programs seem better suited depending on the environment that you're working within? Yeah, well, uh, this is an interesting, a very good question. For example, for our upcoming projects, which we do with the curator Lydia Matthews from the New School in New York, we have been meeting people from the local community and we have been discussing with them and um, uh, we have tried to understand what they would be interested in. So this is one way to approach it. But um, other times when we are in Athens at the Benaki and we want to communicate a certain story that we think as a museum is very important for, our, for, our, for us and for our collection, then it's not so much a community project. It's more like a performance piece. It's more like um, a workshop which can have participatory elements, but um, we sometimes try to focus on the story rather than on the responses of the people to it. It depends on what we want to do. There are other workshops that we do and we are very much interested in how people will, re will respond to what we have to provide. It's, it's a mix of things and that's the, the beautiful thing of multi-sensory practices. You can you can um, decide if you have an ongoing monthly program as we have at the Benaki, you can decide what to do each month and you can have a great variety of things. We don't usually repeat certain uh, workshop designs. Even if they were successful, we, we try not to repeat them. We select new themes and we try to see how they can resonate with new communities. Yes, oh, and it's really um, fascinating to hear about this um, uh, walk shop uh, that you are organizing um, and that you're um, also going to be sharing, a, if I understood correctly, an online broadcast as well, so that if people aren't able to physically be there, at least to be able to capture a sense of the experience of the activities. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we will film, we will produce a film of, the ex of, of what will happen in seed with this focus group of 12, 15 people. And then people from the local community, the artists themselves, will have a chance to present their work online and accept questions and uh, share their thoughts and uh, intentions about this project. Great. There was a question that just came in from Miriam, who was asking um, if the Peel former work will be based on his writings. It's going to be, Fermor has written a wonderful book about the money, which is a place that he loved a lot and he spent more than 40 years of his life there. So 
Of course, we will include in our storytelling parts of his book and parts of his own texts and parts of his friends' um, experiences with him. But we also want to focus on the physical elements of the area. We want to focus on the landscape, on uh, the architecture of his house, and on his architectural choices as well, and the work he did there himself, but also with the help of uh, Nikos Hatzikiriakos Gika, who was a close friend and with whom he they made um, the mosaics of, uh, of the house. So this is a multi-sensory, uh, um, a multi-sensory place. Yes, it sounds like wonderful source yeah. material for inspiration. And yeah. um, it'll be wonderful to see how that evolves with the project. Mm -hmm. um, talking about um, source material for inspiration, there was an earlier question that came in from Jeff asking about the um, piece with the um, electric paint that was inspired mm -hmm. by the uh, Bach um, piece, yeah. if I remembered correctly. Um, yeah. And he was just wondering, it, it, do you remember which fugue that was based on by chance? Uh, I I have it here. Let me let me see if I can locate it now, or otherwise I'll send you. Sure. Well, we can also respond in the in the chat later. So um, I have it here. It's fugue number two okay. in C minor B W V eight four seven. Well, it's just uh, one of many really fascinating projects that you've been able to share with us today. So I think for the interest of time, we should probably wrap up for now. But thank you so much for uh, sharing this overview of your work with us. And I know that um, myself, as well as the viewers, I'm sure will be really interested to continue to follow your work, um, both during this month here at the Siena Art Institute for your residency, um, as well as being able to keep up with you on Instagram. <laughs> so uh, it's really fascinating to hear about your work. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And again, a big thank you to Miriam and all the CN Art Institute staff for this residency here. Thank you. Yes, and thank you also to our viewers for joining us today uh, for this broadcast. I'll just remind you, uh, the same time next week, we will have the next talk in our series. Uh, we'll be speaking next Tuesday with um, another one of our March artists and residents here at the Siena Art Institute, um, Vasiliki um, Spahu. So we hope you can all join us for that event as well. So we'll see you then.